Hello everyone. Welcome to the third part of my build video for this table stop. In this thrilling installment, I'll be showing the making of the clamp and the knob. I'm also going to be giving away the three stops that I made during the course of these videos over on my Patreon page. More on that a little bit later. For now, let's get into the build. First up is the clamp. This is made out of aluminum, and the first thing we need to do is clean up just one end of it. We only need to machine one side because the other end of the part is going to get radius, so there's no reason to put the effort into both. This part is somewhat small, so I'm putting both of my blanks in the vise to keep pressure even across the jaws. Once the end was cut, I moved the part to the center of the vise and set up the table stop that I'm copying against the machined end. Like I said, I made three of these stops, and whenever making multiple identical parts, it's always best to set up a stop so you only need to find the edges once. I found the center in the y-axis by finding both sides of the part and splitting the difference between the two coordinates. The x-axis was found in the usual way on the machined edge. Don't forget to account for half the diameter of the edge finder tip. Much like the base that I made in the previous video, I'm starting with the bore because it is the easiest feature to mess up, and the procedure is the exact same. I began with a spot drill, then switched over to a pilot drill that was slightly larger than the chisel point on the large drill I'm using to drill the hole. Most of the pressure from drilling happens at the very center of a drill where it isn't rotating very quickly, so taking that material away with a pilot drill makes drilling the larger hole loads easier and results in a straighter hole that is closer to on size. The larger drill is a sixteenth of an inch or about one and a half millimeters smaller than the final bore. That gives me plenty of material to remove with the boring head. Unlike the base, I'm not going for a press fit on this piece. That doesn't mean it can fit loosely though. I need it to slide freely, but be close enough in size to allow it to clamp down on the collar, so I aimed for a thousandth or 0.025 millimeters over the size of the column. Other than that, the boring operation was carried out the same way as the base, using my tenth set boring head. Whenever I use a boring head, I want to make sure I know exactly how that boring bar is behaving, so I take multiple cuts at the same depth of cut with a measurement between each one. This lets you know pretty quickly how much flex is happening in the cut, and is an absolute must for accurate work. To make measuring easier, I extended the quill down so the bar is close to the material and I set my quill stop. I used my knee power feed to make the cut because the power down feed on my quill doesn't work very well. There's a lot of wear on this machine and the down feed doesn't want to stay engaged. At the end of the cut, I can just retract the quill and I have plenty of room to get my telescoping gauge into the bore for the measurement. Then I adjust my boring head, drop the knee back down to zero, and lower the quill again for the next pass. Once the bore is done, the next step is to drill a clearance hole for our clamp screw. I need to find the center of the part in the y-axis again since the dimension has changed. I'm utilizing the half button on my DRO again to split the difference between the two edges. I do not, however, need to find the X, because I already have the table stop set up against that edge, and I had the forethought to place it such that it would work with the part in both positions. Use your noggin, everyone. It'll save you time. Since this is just a clearance hole, I'm not as concerned with accuracy here, so I'm using a screw machine length drill held in a collet and just drilling right through without spotting first. This doesn't save much time on one piece, but if you have multiple identical parts, the time saved by eliminating a tool change really adds up, especially on a manual machine where you might need to move the table down or to the side to change tools. Now for the moment at least four of you have been waiting for, the slit. I'll be using an eighth inch or three millimeter slitting saw for this. To touch the saw off, I used the paper trick. If you're unfamiliar with this, you use a piece of paper as a buffer between the tool and the part. You slowly bring the tool and part together while moving the paper between them. When the paper is grabbed by the cutter, the tool is now the thickness of the paper away from the part. This can be done with the cutter running or stopped. When running, I use a longer strip of paper to keep my fingers firmly attached to the rest of my body. I lightly hold the paper so when the cutter grabs, it just yanks the strip right out from between my fingertips. Any kind of paper can be used. You just need to know how thick it is. 
Once the tool is touched off, zero your dial or DRO and move the table up by the thickness of the paper plus half the thickness of the cutter. This will put the center line of your cutter right at the top of the part where I re-zeroed my DRO. Now just move to the middle of the part and your slit will be centered. I made this cut all in one pass and I just lined the depth up by sight. As long as the saw was going to intersect with the bore, I knew I was good to go. Make sure you use plenty of oil on the saw and take your time on the feed rate. This is aluminum so it shouldn't pose any problems at all to the saw. As you can imagine, there's a lot of deburring to do after these operations. I'm using a countersink by hand to take care of the holes and a triangular file to get the easy parts of the slit. The triangular file is perfect for this because it can deburr both sides of the cut simultaneously. It does not work very well on the sides though, so I'm using one of my triangular scrapers for that. Be gentle with these because it's very easy to dig into a soft material like aluminum. Now I need to radius the other end of the clamp and there's a very simple trick to get this done without too much trouble. It involves taking a series of cuts on the outside to nibble away the surface until you have a radius like this. To keep the cuts consistent, you use a piece of material that fits through the bore and rests on the jaws of the vise. Then you can close the vise onto the clamp, take a cut, roll it around a little bit, take another cut, and repeat about 50 times until the job is done. To set the radius, you first have to find the jaw of the vise. To do that, I'm breaking out my paper again because I don't want to actually touch the vise jaws with my cutter. Once the paper grabs, I know I'm the thickness of the paper above the jaw. To make the cut, I need to lower the table so my cutter is the radius of the part plus the radius of the pivot pin above the jaws. Now it's time to make a bunch of cuts. Make as many or as few cuts as you want. This could be done on a rotary table or a CNC machine as well, but the technique I used requires no special tooling and minimal setup. You'll have to deburr the part at some point to allow it to continue pivoting around. Just make sure you don't swing it around too much. If you let the sides of the part go past horizontal, you'll start cutting into the body of the part. Once the cut is done, you're left with a radius that has a lot of facets. These are easily smoothed out with a file or a belt sander. After about five minutes with the file, this is the result, as compared to the faceted original here. That really did not take much effort at all. Like I said at the beginning of the video, I am giving these stops away. Three lucky people will be chosen at random from among all of my patrons over on Patreon at 5 p.m. Central Time on April 1st, 2022. If you want a chance to win one of these dudes and help support the channel while you're at it, head on over to Patreon and sign up. The link is down in the description. Let's get back to the project. To cut the notches on the knob, I'm going to use a set of soft jaws that I made back when I made my original table stop. These will grip the boss very securely and it'll keep it from tilting one way or the other, ensuring that the part is held straight up and down. Now I can basically just make a bolt hole circle to cut my six notches. To do that, I first need to find the center of my part, and for that I'll be using a coaxial indicator. These allow the dial to remain stationary while the indicator stylus circles the part. I'm looking for the needle to move as little as possible, and to get there I move one axis at a time until I find the spot where it moves the least. It often takes a few iterations back and forth, but overall it's a pretty fast and painless process. Just make sure your machine is in low speed before you turn it on. For more information, check out my video on work locating on the milling machine. I'll put a link to it at the end of the video and down in the description. This could also be done using a dial test indicator or even just an edge finder. To actually make the cuts, I'm using an annular cutter. This is the type of cutter used in mag drills and they're great for cuts like this, especially compared to a hole saw which wobbles around a lot and doesn't leave a very good finish at all. You could also use an end mill as well, but this is a big cutout. The cutter is one inch or 25 millimeters in diameter and plunging with large end mills is not my favorite thing in the world. The RPM needs to be slow and that means it's easy to take too big of a bite at one time. So you're either going painfully slowly or watching all your hard work shift in the vise. Neither is my idea of a good time. 
This annular cutter will go through the part relatively smoothly and leave a nice surface finish on the side. I have a special annular cutter holder with an R8 shank. There's usually a pin that goes through the annular cutter and there's a spring down in the holder with a plunger up in this area. When you put this whole thing together, the pin will get pushed in as you cut. There's actually quite a bit of tension behind it. If you were cutting a full hole with this, the pin would eject the center slug of metal from the cutter when you're done. I shouldn't actually need the pin though because I'm just cutting a partial circle, so I'll leave it out. Let's talk about bolt circles and how to figure out the coordinates. I think every machinist should know how to find coordinates with trigonometry. I know that's a scary word for some folks, but it's pretty simple really. Believe it or not, this is all the information you need to find all six of these holes. In our case, the center point is going to be 0, 0. That's generally how I like to do it. We have the diameter, and therefore the radius of the circle. We know how many holes there are, and we know how many degrees there are in a circle, 360. So we can divide 360 by the number of holes to find the angle between holes. In this case, that's 60 degrees between each hole. We also have symmetry on our side here. These two holes are at the 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock positions, and are only movements in the x-axis. That means the distance from the center to the hole is the radius of the circle, 1.5 inches. Likewise with this hole, and there's no movement at all in the y-axis. These four holes are also symmetrical. They're all going to be the same distance in the x and y axes, with the only difference being whether the coordinates are positive or negative. All this means that we only need to figure out one triangle to find all of these coordinates. We know it's 60 degrees between holes, so we have a 60 degree angle in our triangle. We also know that the radius of our circle is 1.5 inches, so that's the length of our hypotenuse. And if you remember back to high school trig, there was a mnemonic device called SOKATOA. That means the sine of this angle is equal to the opposite side over the hypotenuse. The cosine of the same angle equals the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. That tells us if we're trying to find the x-axis coordinate, we need to use cosine because it's the adjacent side. And if we're finding the y-axis coordinate, we need to use sine since it's the opposite side. The formulas are very easy. Since the unknown dimensions are the lengths of the adjacent and opposite sides, and we know the angle and the length of the hypotenuse, we use cosine 60 times 1.5 to find the x-coordinate, and sine 60 times 1.5 to find the y-coordinate. If we do the math, we end up with an x-coordinate of 0 0.750 inches and a y-coordinate of 1.299 inches. And like I said, all four of these holes are going to be the exact same coordinates, with the only difference being whether they're going to be positive or negative numbers on the DRO. Yes, you can use CAD to figure all of this out if that's available to you, but honestly, where is the fun in that? There are also numerous bolt circle calculators that you can find on the internet or in machinist apps for your mobile device. With those, you can input your circle diameter, the number of holes, and the starting angle, and the calculator will poop out your numbers. Starting angles follow CAD conventions, by the way, so 0 degrees is at the 3 o'clock position, 90 is at 12 o'clock, and it proceeds around the circle from there, moving counterclockwise. Lastly, there is the DRO if you have one. Most DROs have a bolt circle calculator these days, and they're all going to be a little bit different, so check your owner's manual on how to use it. On the Sino DRO from Shars, it has this button right here that looks like a bolt hole circle. All you have to do is smash that like the like and subscribe buttons. It will first come up with this display saying PCD underscore XY, and then you have to hit enter. Now you have to input all the parameters starting with the center position. Like I said, that's going to be X0, Y0. From here on out, you use the arrow keys to cycle through the options. Next up is the circle diameter, which in this case is going to be 3 inches. Notice that it's the diameter and not the radius. Next we have the number of holes. Starting angle is up next, 
And again, zero is the three o'clock position like I mentioned before. Lastly, we have the ending angle. This is the degree position of the last hole. So in this case, it's 300 degrees. This is really not clear in the manual and it took me several tries to figure out what it should be. Hit the down arrow again and it'll give you the XY coordinate for your first hole. Then you move the table until both axes read zero and you're in place. Hit the down arrow again to move to the next hole location and move the table to zero again. Lather, rinse, and repeat for the rest of the holes. Now that I've talked about math for too long and my retention rate has plummeted, let's cut these notches. I'm using the quill to make the cut just like I would with a drill. I set my quill stop though so I don't accidentally plow into my vise when I break through. As you can see, I used a good amount of oil to help out with the cut. Then it's just a matter of going to each coordinate and letting that baby eat. Ooh, and let me tell you, baby was hungry. I had a whole lot of deburring to do on each side of those notches, but a triangular scraper made pretty short work of it. That's it for the build. If you end up making one of these, I would love to see your version. You can send me a picture of it over on Instagram at Stuart DeHaro. If you have any questions or topics you'd like to see me cover in a future video, leave those down in the comments section below. Hit that like and subscribe button if you think I've earned it, and please consider supporting the channel over on Patreon like the wonderful people you can see on your screen right now. You might want to check out these other videos as well. On the right, I have a playlist of all of my project videos. On the top left, I have my most recent video, and on the bottom left, there's my video on work locating that I mentioned earlier. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.